kind of flow I'm giving it some heart and soul Now in the darkest grays The sun burns clouds break Yeah, we see that fire From the streets of Babylon To the road that we've been on long The light is hoping another Whoa, oh, oh Yeah, this is the light of the cover Today feels like no other The darkest day The sun burst out break Whoa, oh, oh Yeah, this is the light in motion Just when I could run this race No more sun burst out break Life in color Some hope in me The black and white sets us free Like the queen of the rook Your decision was a sure thing Honey, I sure think No wonder I feel Like I'm missing a heavy load But no matter what daylight brings to us We will know Yeah, this is like a color Feels like no other in the darkest ways. Sun burst out break. Whoa, oh, yeah, this is like motion. Just when I could run this race, no more. The sun burst out break. Life in color. This is life in color. Oh, 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 this is light and color. Today feels like no other. The darkest grace. The sun burst out break. Whoa, oh, oh. And this is life light motion. Today feels like to run this race. No more. The sun burst out break. This is life in color. on Sunday morning, as the new day was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went out to visit the tomb. Suddenly there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, rolled aside the stone, and sat on it. His face shone like lightning, and his clothing was as white as snow. The guards shook with fear when they saw him, and they fell into a dead faint. Then the angel spoke to the women. Don't be afraid, he said. I know you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. He isn't here. He has risen from the dead, just as he said would happen. Come see where his body was lying. And now, go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead, and he is going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there. Remember what I have told you. The women ran quickly from the tomb. They were very frightened but also filled with great joy and they rushed to give the disciples the angel's message. And as they went, Jesus met them and greeted them and they ran to him, grasped his feet and worshipped him. I want to make sure I didn't cheat anybody out of the Easter story. So there you have it. Did you get your fix? You good? You good. Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. Come on. It's Saturday night. Come on. That's it. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. Oh, Easter, Easter, Easter. Man, it's always a good time to try to uh, figure out how to 
to uh, talk about Easter. Every year, this, ca- this, this calendar never changes. And every year, here we are, it's Easter. They, and God did this to us preachers every year. Christmas and Easter, Christmas and Easter, same story every year. But you know, it never gets old. It's amazing. It's an incredible story. And as you study it, it always opens up uh, new areas of awareness to you. It's really a neat story. You know, I was, I was thinking about uh, getting ready this week. It dawned on me that, that, that Jesus, he didn't need to do this. You know, <laughs> like he totally didn't need to do it. He's the eternal son of almighty God. The, the, the Bible says he's the creator of heaven and earth. Like he existed. If no one ever repented and turned to him, he was God well before us. He's God way off. Like he's God. He didn't need to do this. It was an amazing gift to all of us, right? And, and, and so he, you think about this. Jesus, the one who doesn't need to do this, and and. And he did it though. Why? So he could he he to seek and to save the lost. And and the scriptures say that he came that you might have abundant life. You know, life to the full, life overflowing, a really good life. Jesus came to give you a good life. Look at your neighbor and say, Jesus came to give you a good life. Say it. I want to hear it. Do you guys believe this? Now I'm telling you, man, it's amazing news. He came to give us a, an abundant new life, a new life, like not the same life that you had before you came to Christ, not the same exact thing. You should be able to see something different about who you are. The scriptures tell us several times over and over again. Uh, here's one, Romans 6, 4. For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism, and just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. We're to have a new life in Christ. Colossians 2, 12, another one, so similar. For you were buried with Christ, and like him you'll be raised, what? to new life because you trusted in the mighty power of God that raised Christ from the dead. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If anyone is in Christ, he is what? A new creation. The old has passed. Behold the new man. It's a new person. You're not supposed to be the same that you were before but wearing a cross, which by the way, you left your cross here. Show, show This is the cross of crosses, man. You want to be holy? Check out this guy. Dude, I'm talking about it right there, right? Do you all know Tommy? It's Tommy. Hi, Tommy. So we have, we've been called to new life, something new. And now you're wondering, I'm sure, what in the world does that have to do with all these colors? <laughs> we got this crazy scene in here. You got all these colors, very visual. Again, thank you for everyone who did this. I'm going to connect it the best that I can. Do you know how many colors there are? How many primary colors are there? There's three. There's three. There's three. There's three primary colors in the spectrum. They're red, green, and blue. Did you know that? It's kind of boring now. See, when I said there's only three, did you feel like the, way, the, the wind went out of your sails a little bit? You wanted a little bit more, right? True? You want a little bit more than that. The primary color is red, green, and blue. Kind of talking about new life, right? I'd say that red, green, and blue are kind of like every person has that. Nose, ears. Some of us have a little bit more nose than others. Ears. We all sleep. We all eat food. Hebrew, yeah, yeah. We all sleep. But you know, there's way more than that. There's more than just the primary colors. Those are kind of boring to me. They're kind of boring to me. You know, the human eye, it's, it's funny. I love science. Science is so amazing. Some people think that science and faith don't connect. It's amazing to me because when I see what scientists do, that's all they're doing is proving the majesty, power, and the existence of God. That's what they do. They think that they're not. They're trying to disprove them, and they constantly come up with more evidence of God's existence. Yeah, just go back a little bit. Do you, do you know... Um, Everyone used to think that the earth was flat. That was pretty stupid, right? You know, the Bible says that God looks down upon the circle of the earth. Right? So, so their assumption is that God was up here. What happens, though, this same Bible that says that he's everywhere at every moment, what happens if God was looking at the planet from here? 
That wouldn't be very round, would it? But scientists working diligently to prove that God doesn't exist, prove that he was right again. He sits wherever he sits, wherever he chooses to be, and at any view, he sits and looks at the circle of the earth. That was free. Scientists talk about color. Scientists, I love them because they do, they do um, further the evidence uh, that God exists and his power and his imagination, his creativity, and his truth. Um, but they also fight about stuff. And we don't do that as Christians. We all agree on everything, and I know. But scientists, they're always fighting. And so I looked up online to see how many colors did the human eye see? Because on the spectrum, there's just these three. There's red, green, and blue. But the human eye this is where scientists fight. Some scientists, in their, in their reputable places, they said that there's about 10 I'm sorry, 100,000 colors that the human eye sees. Some scientists go as far as saying that we can see up to 10 million colors. You see, there's so much more than meets the eye. We think that there's, there's just these colors, this red, green, and blue, and that's kind of boring, but there's so much more to see. And, and everybody's walking around red, green, and blue. You know what I mean? They're just existing but they're not living. And everything in life, everything that we see, everything that you lay your eyes on is within the spectrum of the 10 million colors. Like every single thing you see is in that spectrum of color. And we wanna see, you can see life in those colors. And I wanna talk about seeing things because we've tried our very best with our creative gifting to create a visual experience in here with you tonight, to see life in color, to see life lived, more than just existing. I want to talk about seeing. I want to talk about what God sees. And to do this, I want to take you back to the third, fifth, and sixth days of creation. And so if you have your Bible, this is a real tough one. We're not going to put it on the screen. Guess what page that's on? Mary gets, I was going to say a cookie, but you made them. Page one of the Bible. Please, I want you to look. It's kind of weird to go to Genesis, right, for the resurrection of Jesus Christ, but man, I'm telling you, Jesus is all over the place in this book. He kind of stacked the deck. I want to go to the second, I'm sorry, the, the, uh, the third day first, and I'm going to read a little bit with you. I want to see what God sees and let's see what God sees and let's see what he looked at and saw and said it was good. It was good. This is what he said. Let's start in verse 11 of chapter 1. He says this. Then God said, let the land sprout with vegetation, every sort of seed-bearing plant, and trees that grow seed-bearing fruit. These seeds will then produce the kinds of plants and trees from which they came. And that is what happened. I love power like that, right? That's crazy power. This is what's going to happen, and it did. The land produced vegetation, all sorts of seed-bearing plants, and trees with seed-bearing fruit. Their seeds produced plants and trees of the same kind. And so God looks at this thing that he did. He sees these, these things that he made, and he sees that they are to produce the same kind. And what is his response to that? It's good. It makes God happy. He said, this is a good system. This is a good way. I like this. Jump down to verse 20. This is the fifth day of creation. Then God said, let the waters swarm with fish and other life. Let the skies be filled with birds of every kind. So God created great sea creatures and every living thing that scurries and swarms in the water and every sort of bird each producing offspring of the same kind. And what does he say again? And God saw that it was good. Let's go to the next day of creation. Verse 25. God made all sorts of wild animals, livestock and small animals, each able to produce offspring of the same kind. And what happens? God saw that it was good. Life that creates life. That is what makes God happy. 
Life that recreates life. All of these things that he made were able to reproduce of the same kind. That's the way he designed it. And so, here we are, Easter. It's springtime here in the States. It's a beautiful time of year. And this is so apparent right now, life creating life. Everywhere around you, you see new life this time of year. We, we see trees with, with new leaves popping out. And we see, we see the orange blossoms, which, who loves orange blossoms? I hate them. Do you hear me snorting up here all the time? It's because of them. It's, it's beautiful, though. All the trees are budding flowers. Bunnies are being born. It's a beautiful time of year. Like our opening video where we read the resurrection story, we see all these flowers bursting, new leaves. We saw one picture of a, of a bride with her bouquet. It's, it's a wedding celebration, you know, and wedding celebrations, they're, they're most popular in the spring, aren't they? Because, because the major characteristic of spring is what? New life. And so we're celebrating new life. We celebrate the fact that there's a man and there's a woman. Yeah, you heard me say it. You, there's a man and there's a woman, and each one of them is a separate life that God created in his image to be like him. And so here's the man, and he's got a life. And here's the woman, and she's got a life of her own, her own identity. And then what happens? God does something, and he mingles the soul. And the two become one, a new life, a new person. When you say, you better check with my better half, you're right. She's your better half. He's your better half. It's one person. It's like a newborn baby. It's a new person, right? You, you, guys, we can't do what we wanted to do like we used to do, right? You can't leave your crap everywhere. Mama yells at you. You, you can't just walk around stinking and not showering and shaving and stuff. You got you to gotta look good. You got to take care of yourself. It's a new person, right? A whole new person is born. And that's what happens during the springtime. It's new life. So the question we should be asking ourselves during this new life season is this. What am I, rep what am I reproducing? W what, what am I multiplying? If, if God designed us life that recreates life, what kind of life are you reproducing? What kind of footprint are you leaving? What, what's in the wake behind you? What, what are you reproducing? Well, that makes great sense. We're supposed to reproduce something, but maybe you don't know what you're supposed to reproduce. Maybe we're just clueless. We don't know what we're supposed to do. Someone along the line told us what we're supposed to do. What do we do? Say your prayers. Take your vitamins. Keep your nose clean. Get a good job. Have a few kids. I think Hulk Hogan told us to do that, really. Was it him? You know, I don't even read the Bible. Maybe it was Austin 316 is what you're thinking about. Eat your vitamins. Say your prayers. Well, what are we supposed to do? Well, you know what? God is so good. Say God's good. God is good. You guys awake tonight? It's exciting, man. It's Easter. He's alive. He's alive. God's alive. And he lives inside of you. That's pretty exciting news. He's inside of you. That's exciting. It's exciting. It's exciting. God lives inside of you. He lives inside of you. Give me some. He, hey, hey, look, at she's having a baby. Did you, all, did you see the video? Yes. If you weren't here last week? Yeah. Awesome. Give me some. God's alive. God's alive. Listen, the Bible is very, very clear. It tells you what you're supposed to reproduce. What are you supposed to do? Romans 8, 29. You ready? Romans 8, 29. For God knew his people in advance. And don't start to, oh, okay, he's a Calvinist. He's a Calvinist. Here's the Calvinist stuff coming in. It's not about Calvinists. Let me tell you something. Uh, how many, God, God knew his people in advance. How many people that's ever lived on this earth, from the first man to, to, to baby Lexi, how many of them did God know? Every single one of them, right? He knew every single person that's ever been created, and his choice for them is to be like his son. 
That's what he wants. He wants us to be like his son, right. So that the son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters, right here, right? The firstborn, the highest in rank and privilege, the first one of his kind, and we would all be his brothers and sisters, and we would be like him. He's the visible image of the invisible God, and now we are the visible image of the invisible Jesus. That's us. And so he wants us to be just like him in character, and he wants us to be just like him in purpose and on mission, just like Jesus. So we copy Jesus' life. We open the scriptures, and we get to know, Paul said, I want to know this Christ. And we open the scriptures so we can know this Jesus, so we can be like him in character, purpose, and mission. And what are we supposed to do? What's the ultimate goal? What is the, what is the Christ follower to do? To make disciples just the same. Jesus came to do that. He made disciples, right? He took fishermen and he said, now I want you to be a fisherman of men. And so then he makes you, a, uh, uh, he catches you on hook, line, and sinker. And you're his disciple and we're supposed to be like his son. So what's our mission in life? To make more of who we are. To reproduce that which God has created in us. He's put us, his spirit inside of us. He has changed our life. He has changed everything about who we are. And he just says, listen, do exactly like I did. Go make fishers of men. Go make disciples. Let me read something. Do you guys know who David Platt is? David Platt wrote a book called Radical. It was a, a huge, huge book, one of the biggest sellers in the history of Christianity. But he wrote this about making disciples, because some people may think it's a little bit boring. He said this, he said, He, God, has designed all of his people to know his joy as we share his love, spread his word, and multiply his life among all of the people of the earth. This is the grand purpose for which we were created, to enjoy the grace of Christ as we spread the gospel of Christ from wherever we live to the ends of the earth. Can someone say amen? Amen, amen. So we're to make disciples, and the greatest joy that we could possibly have in our life is going and reproducing what God has done in us, in other people. If you have ever led someone to Christ and dunked them in the tank, it is the greatest rush you will ever feel in your life. It is the greatest joy you will ever feel. Nothing compares to it. It's amazing. It's amazing. To think about this for a moment, just think... It's not just, you're, you're participating in, in the eternity, like, say, like a billion years. You're changing, you're involved. God lets you be involved with someone's billion years. You get to be a part of what God is doing in their life for eternity. It is the greatest joy, and it's insane. Did you, they were crying. I mean, it's crazy. It's, it's, you lose it when it happens. If, 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 if you think that you should bring someone to the preacher to get them baptized and saved, you're missing out. I wouldn't do that to you. I want you to have the joy. I want you to take them to your bathtub at your house. I want you to share the gospel with them and chuck them in the tub. It's the greatest joy you'll ever have. It was amazing. It was amazing. Dan is an elder of our church. God bless his heart. He's growing in the Lord. He's a great dude. He called me one day from the old building. I'm going to baptize someone. All of a sudden, I get a picture. He's, he's at the tank, and he's baptizing his nephew. Like, that's amazing, right? That's amazing. Go baptize someone, man. You just, it, it's a high you'll never, ever want to come down off of. It's amazing. We are to, to reproduce that which we are, but are we to be cookie cutters? Are we to be cookie cutters? Does that mean that you reproduce exactly who you are? See, reproducing is not really replicating, right? You're not replicating you. You're taking the Jesus and you're, you're reproducing that in people. And they're going to be a little bit different. They're not all going to be the same, right? Who likes housing developments with, when every house is exactly the same? <laughs> right? My development, we have like six or seven models. It was like, eh, but that's pushing it. But you go into those, you know what I'm talking about. The ones that you drive into and you go, man, I want to live out in the country. 
No one wants to cookie cutter Christianity. It's lame and boring. Let me, there's a picture, there's some oak trees up here. Can you put that up there for a second, Cheryl? See that? Those are oak trees, right? Oak trees, they have acorns, and inside the acorn is another tree. And that little bitty, bitty little acorn is one of those things, one of them monsters. Do you see the top picture? Do you see the dude sitting up there? Can you see that? There's a man standing at the base of that tree. You can hardly see him. That's how big that tree is. And that tree came out of an itty bitty little acorn. That's crazy. God put inside an acorn that big, that tree. But when you, when you look at the acorn, and you look at the acorn of the tree below it, they might look the same. But they're not. Because look what came out of them. Look at the tree up there. Down like this, all different wacky directions. And this one down the bottom, right, goes up. Two oak trees, but they're way different in height and width and, and color and texture. And heaven only knows what direction each and every branch is going to go into. You know, you look at a forest of oak trees and you see that they're all oak trees, but no oak tree is the same, is it? Every single one of them is a little bit different, but they're an oak tree. How many flowers of the field who have a seed-bearing, it's a seed-bearing flower, and they recreate that which is the same, but how many flowers of the field are exact identical twins? None. That's the answer right here. Are you guys thinking about it? <laughs> You're like, I don't know. I, I've never really examined it that closely, you know. I'm, so you got daisies and you got tulips and all that kind of stuff, but they're never the same. They're all a little bit different. And it's the same with the body of Christ. It's the same all over nature. How many species of birds are there? I am so glad that you asked me. 10,064 known species of birds. 10,064. How many species of fish are there? I am so glad that you asked me. 32,400 known species of fish. Do they have fins? Do they have scales? Do they go, I don't know, something like that, right? I got that from Louis Anderson. You all know what this was, right? It was a fish. Bob's got it. I don't even know why, but this was a fish. The chicken's this way. The fish is this way. You guys want to do it with me? It's so much fun. Who's fun? Come on, Ma. Come on, Pete. You're lame. Not the chicken dance. The fish. This way, not up. 32,400, all kinds of diversity in the creative order, but they're all fish, right? The same thing in the body of Christ, there's massive diversity within the body of Christ. There's different gifting, there's different service, there's different cultural um, impact upon us. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm a Christian, I live in Eustis. I'm going to be way different than a Christian who lives in Thailand. Do you know what I'm saying? They have a different world around them. So we, both, we would both open up a Bible and, re and read and agree that Jesus Christ is Lord and he went to the cross and all that stuff. But he's, the way he functions and the way that she worships is going to be way different than mine because cultural impact and influence uh, changes my life. So we're going to have lots of different uh, gifting and diversity within the body of Christ. But listen... Uh, we're going to all, God's going to do a, a work in all of us. We're all going to have new desires, and we're all going to have new tastes, and we're all going to have a new budget, I hope. Someone say amen. amen. We're all going to have a new perspective. We're all going to have new priorities. But in all those things, there's diversity, right? We're not all going to give the same amount. We're not all going to enjoy the same songs, we're not all going to wear the same things, although Jimmy and I pulled it off tonight and looking good. I'm just saying. Not as good as you, but I'm just saying. So we're all going to be different, but listen, every, and this is the time to check up, okay? Every Christian, though, every Christian will have a growing compassion for those that are in need. Everyone. And if you don't feel that swelling up inside of you, it's time to maybe take a day off from work and spend some time with the Lord because God will do that in all of us. Not only will we have a growing compassion for those that are in need where we just kind of put off our own agenda and pick up somebody else's and, and forsake a meal 
and, and give someone a meal. Maybe forsake going out to dinner or going to the movies to help somebody else, to put others before ourselves. But here's something else that all Christ followers will have. A growing desire to get alone with the Father. Everyone just, listen, what did it say in Romans 8, 29? That we would be what? Just like his son. And God the Son spent time with God the Father. And there should be a growing desire to spend time with the Lord. Like his son could take on a whole variety of different looks. But let me offer you a couple of them. Um, Matthew 4.23, it says this, that Jesus went from place to place. He just went from here and there. And what did he do? He was teaching and announcing the good news about the kingdom. That's what he did. That was what his life was about. He went from place to place, sharing the kingdom with people. And what did he do when he did that? He brought life to that town. He brought eternal, new, different life to these people. He brings life no matter where he goes. Do you do this? Do you do this? Be like Jesus. Matthew chapter 8, there's a man with leprosy. Lepers were outcasts. Shunned, disliked, disowned, lived outside of the camp. You didn't go near them. But when the man with leprosy came, Jesus pursued him. And what did he say? I'm willing. Those are beautiful words. Those are beautiful words. I am willing. The eternal son of God, creator of heaven and earth, to stop what he's doing and says, I am willing not only to help you, but to not care what public opinion is, not care if he's shunned, and absolutely doing something where there's no reciprocation likely. What would a leper do for Jesus? What, what could a leper, what could a social outcast do for Jesus? Likely nothing. But what did Jesus say? I am willing. I am willing. He's beautiful. Matthew chapter 8 also, there's a Roman soldier who has a sick servant. And Jesus is going around town and he's, and he's blessing and he's preaching and he's teaching and he's healing. He's doing all these different things. And he's a busy man. Who's busy? Everybody? We're all busy. Look at your calendar, right? It's crazy. But, but Jesus, it says here, he stops and he says, I will come and I will heal him. So he, you see on display this whole idea of putting others before yourself. Was Jesus busy? Anyone ever read the Gospels, right? He's extremely busy. He's not just putting together sales reports and documents and cleaning houses. Like, I'm not making light of what we do, but he created the heavens and the earth, and, and he's healing lepers and, and, and raising dead people and multiplying happy meals and, and, and walking on water and stuff like that. He's really, really busy casting out demons, and he stops what he's doing and says, I will go. And, and, and that wasn't right there either. He had to go to another place to do it. And the, and the soldier says, hey, listen, you don't even have to, don't, 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 don't even come to my house. You're too good. So he just, he just throws his voice, if you will, and says, yeah, he'll, he'll be healed. At that moment, the kid was healed. But he says, I'm willing to go and heal him. Others first. I will break my own plans. Matthew 20, here's another one. There's two blind men. Again, what could two blind men, social outcasts, do for the creator of heaven and earth? Nothing. Nothing. But what does Jesus do? You can see in his words, he's relentlessly pursuing and blessing and helping. And he looks at the men and he says, what do you want me to do for you? Like, I want to help you. What do you want me to do? I want to help you. That's who Jesus is. I'm willing. I'll break my plans. I'll come after you. You first. I want nothing in return. I just want to bless you. Is your default, yes, I want to, and yes, I will? That's the question. 1 Corinthians 15, 45, the scriptures tell us that Jesus Christ is, not was, is a life-giving spirit. That's who Jesus is. Are you? See, we're supposed to be life recreating life. We're supposed to see beauty. Our mission statement here includes that. 
We're a gospel-centered, culture-creating community bringing beauty to the world. That's who this church is, individually and corporately. And so Jesus Christ was a life-giving spirit, bringing beauty to the world. Wherever he went, he brought a life-giving spirit. And the question that I have for you is, do you? Are you the type of person that people want to be around? Or do they dodge down the hallway there at Walmart when they see you coming? Are you the person that, that comes with a smile? That comes with a compliment? That comes with an encouragement? Comes with an invitation? Come over to my house, we'll have dinner. Let's hang out. Do you have the word of God in your heart that you can share it with somebody to bring life to them? That's what Jesus was. That's who Jesus is. He's a life-giving spirit. See, when we, we did this because this is the best that we could do in our creative endeavors to, to display what we should be. When, when, when people see us, do they see this? Do they see life in color or do they see primary colors? Red, green, and blue? Yellow? yellow? No, not yellow. Yeah. Although yellow is my favorite color. It's red, yellow. green, yellow, blue. yeah, red, yellow, blue. That's what it was. Scientists fight about that too. Did you look it up too? See, we're supposed to be like Jesus, right? Let me tell you, let me get, this is a great scripture. Habakkuk 3.4. I know, you know, it's not widely quoted. This is what it says of the Lord. It says of God, his coming is as brilliant as the sunrise. When, when, when God, in the presence of God, there is fullness of joy, right? His coming, when he shows up, it's as brilliant as the sunrise. My, my wife and I, uh, before these babies, when we used to have a life, we, 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 <laughs> bay. we, used, to, we used to get up early and, and, and over where Adriana goes to school, there's a parking lot that overlooks a lake. And we would, we would go there and, we, and it's, we would take the old junky Volvo and we would get a cup of coffee and we would go there before the sun came up and we would park and open up the tailgate, bring pillows, and we would lay there and we would watch the sunrise. I miss those days. <laughs> oh, heaven, I miss those days. I'll have them again in like, nine, in like 2030. <laughs> and then they'll be dropping off their stinking grandkids. I mean, their beautiful grandkids. But we used to sit there and watch it and, and it would be dark. And, and the clouds would begin to lighten. And all of a sudden you'd see streams of light come up. And then a gentle kiss right on the sunrise. Right on the, on the horizon. And you'd see those colors just. And we, we go gaga over sunsets. That's because we're awake. Check out a sunrise. It's equally as beautiful. It's just different. It's amazing. And it's tranquil. And it's beautiful. And it's the dawn of a new day, new life. And then what happens? What do you start hearing? The birds chirping. The cars start to go by. And that's not as beautiful as a bird chirping, but they're people. And life begins. And, and, and the scriptures say that that's what it's like when God shows up. And we're supposed to be like him. So are, are we, when, can someone, are they going to write that on your gravestone? That, that the coming of Mary is as brilliant as the sunrise. I hope so. I hope, I hope that, that God will continue to work on me so that I can be that type of person. Beautiful in color and texture and depth. It's gorgeous. Can that be said of you? God saw all that he had made, all the creative order reproducing of the same kind, and he said it was good. It was good. But when sin enters into creation, man does continue that venture of reproducing his own kind. But when sin enters the creation, what's he doing? He's creating more and more and more sinful men. And that is not the beautiful colors of creation. That is black and dark and evil and ugly. And he doesn't look at that and say that that is good. That's not good. And this sin, we all know, 
From the garden, he said, if you sin, you'll surely die. And he said it to us every day. He says, the wages of your sin is death. Nothing's changed. This sin leads to death. But God so loved us all that he sends his son on a rescue mission to seek and to save and to provide a beautiful, abundant life. God is good. And he absorbs the full wrath of God's punishment for sin on the cross and provides full atonement for our sin. In today's vernacular, we would say, Lord, it's all good. It's all good. Everything's good now because of what Jesus did. Because Jesus dies on the cross and being made sin, he surely should die. But being Savior... He now lives. He now lives. So that those who belong to him should not taste death, but have an abundant, new, beautiful life. He did it for you. Not simply drinking less and cussing less, but truly seeking God, being Christ-like in both character and in mission. So, brief tonight. Here we are in 2015. It's spring. It's a new season. And we're talking about life creating life. And so, since we're all together as a church family, I want to just tell you that I believe that 2015 is our year. I think that after all the, the trials and craziness that has, that has been SNL Church and now Revolution Church, we've been around the block a couple of times. I feel, like we're, I, I feel like we're out in the desert sometimes going around and around the mountain, you know? But I think 2015 is going to be a big year. And I think that this message that God has given us about life creating life, that's supposed to be us. And I think that, that this year, we are more so than ever going to put down our own agenda. And we're going to pick up God's agenda more aggressively. I, I, I want to partner with you guys. I, I want to be a family that, that recreates life. That, that genuinely does bring beauty to the world. That, 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 that the world can see this risen Savior that they would see us and know that Jesus lives because they see it in you. They see Jesus in you and that every person you run into, they could say, you know what? I love when he shows up in my life. I love it because when I see him in Walmart, I, I pursue him, I don't duck. I want to talk to him. I want to talk to her because she smiles, because she's full of joy, because she has a good word on her lips. She has a hug for me. She has an invitation for me. She's my friend. He's my friend. He's pleasant. A life-giving spirit. And that's what I believe our church has been called to do. You know, our name, Revolution, it, it, it's pregnant with a lot of truth. But here's the thing. Everything I'm talking to you about right now, it doesn't run rampant through our world, does it? Not too many people can say of anyone that that person's coming is as brilliant as the sunrise, right? Usually it's like, oh, what does she want? <laughs> right? You see, I mean, come on now. You all know the decline button on your phone. You all press it. I'm not the only one. Don't leave me hanging. Oh, what does she want? This is not good news, right? How about that you look down at that phone and you see Wendy's face and you go, I can't wait. Yes. What's up? You can't wait to talk to her. You can't wait to hear what she has to say because she is a life-giving spirit. And that's who we're supposed to be. And as a church family, I'm calling you to that. I want to I wanna encourage you to continue to let the Lord work on you, to, to, to be less of yourself and be more of Jesus so that the world can see that he really does live. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now, I would like to... Uh